Um, so yeah, it's going to take us a little while to get to Luke 8, uh, but we are going to get there. One of the things about Luke 8, as we um, begin to narrow in on what we're uh, looking at for this Sunday, one of the big things that, that kind of centers on Luke 8 is, uh, as you read it, it's a parable that's given from uh, Jesus to his disciples, um, is how do I believe? Or what is my belief like? Or as he talks about the soil, and the soil is a, a picture of our hearts as it receives the Word of God, what's the soil of my heart like? Is what you're supposed to ask yourself as you um, read that passage. If you look ahead just a, f- a little bit in Luke 8, read, uh, go to verse 1 of Luke 8 and see what this says. Uh, if, you were to, if you were to say, um, well, well, what's an example of somebody who listened well and believed well. Like, like if the, at the end of this parable it says, if you are one who listens well and believes, there will be a fruit that comes out of your life. So well, what would that look like? Well, that's exactly what he says like from verses 1 to 3 of chapter 8. He gives us an example. Before we even get the, uh, the parable, there is an example of those who believed and then also lived and began to, to give fruit uh, because of what they believed. So look at this, just for a second. Chapter 8, verse 1. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming, bringing the good news. That's he is Jesus, just so you know. Proclaiming, bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also with also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, this is a, this is a for instance, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. Here's a group of women in the Scripture who believed and their lives were changed, and already their life is bringing new fruit. So it's an incredible picture. Um, And then Jesus goes into, hey, you want your life to bring good fruit? Well, you need to believe. The seed is being sown. You need to believe. So as we begin this focus this week, we are starting a new study for the summer, and we're going to look at a creed. Uh, we don't often do this. We usually go through whole books of the Bible and go uh, section by section or, or verse by verse. Uh, but over the summer, we are going to look at the Apostles' Creed. How many of you grew up in a setting where they said the Apostles' Creed almost every week? Let me see your hand. All right, I'm surprised we had that many. That's great. Uh, The Apostles' Creed was rehearsed for you um, week after week. In many churches, that's the case. And I want to show you why a little bit as we move through. But the Apostles' Creed helps us so much because... It is uh, an early attempt in the Christian church at trying to uh, take all the teaching, the key teachings of the apostles as they received it from Christ and, and to sum it up in kind of the irreducibles of the faith. Here are the irreducibles of the Christian faith. That's what the Apostle Creed attempts to do. So you can, uh, as we go through this over the summer, you can uh, look at it and say, well, does it? Does it actually? Like if I were to say to you, um, sum up for me the beliefs that you hold in your life. Give me a sum, the irreducible sum total of the beliefs that you hold in your life. Like what is the most important things that make up you in your life? Could you sum those most important things up? And so this is what the Apostle Creed does, is that it takes the most important things that are a matter of the early church's faith and sums them up for us so we can look at it clearly. So hopefully you'll see that as we go through. This is the Apostle's Creed, and it's designed to help us understand the most important things of the Christian faith. So here's what I want to, see, want to show you as we go through. The uh, Apostles' Creed starts with, and we're going to recite it in a little while, 
But it starts with, I believe in. That's how it begins. I believe in. And so for a couple of weeks, this week will be a little bit uh, longer than next week. Next week will be a very shortened uh, focus as we start our summer in the park. Uh, But I believe in. We're going to look at that for two weeks. I believe in. And I want to show you a couple of things about I believe in. I want to help you answer three questions. Do you believe? First of all, is the first question. Second question, what is the basis of belief? And third question, does what you believe matter? So do you believe? What is the basis of your belief? And does what you believe really matter? Does it matter what you believe? Do you believe? How would you answer that question? Do you believe? Are you a person who believes? Just like on a basic level, are you a person who believes? Uh, Some of you um, might see yourselves the way I see myself. I see myself as a uh, a skeptic. I'm optimistic, but I'm an optimistic skeptic. Is, is, Is there such a thing? It's like you can tell me, um, you know what? Fortune Donuts has the best donuts in the city. You can tell me that. I'd be optimistic about it, but I'm not really going to take your word on it. I'm going to need to go buy a couple dozen to make sure. I'm a skeptic, but I'm optimistic. What about you? When someone tells you something, are you ready to believe it? Are you a believer? Do you believe? Well, in an everyday sense, we all have a function of belief. For instance, are you a morning person, yes or no? Are you, are, do you get up in the morning ready to go? Are you out of bed and going? Or do you need an alarm to wake you up? And not just one alarm or two alarms. But like around the fifth alarm, you're waking up. Why do you set an alarm? Do you believe the alarm is going to wake you up? Yeah, you do. You're a person of belief. It's why you set an alarm. Well, how do you know that the alarm is going to wake you up? Because you've experienced it, right? It has done that before. Your your belief is based on your experience. So in that regard, you do believe things, we all believe, in things that we've experienced. So the alarm will wake us up. I set the alarm, it wakes me up. I experience that. Are you a person of belief? Do you believe that things like 2 plus 2 equal 4? This is not a philosophy class, so don't go off on me. Those of you who have taken philosophy classes... And they try to convince you that 2 plus 2 doesn't equal 4. But for some other reason, it equals something completely different. Do you believe 2 plus 2 equals 4? You guys are all skeptics. Yes? Yes. Why do you believe 2 plus 2 equals 4? Because it does. <laughs> it's fact. Right? So we believe, you're all believers. We all believe in stuff. We believe that alarm clocks will wake us up because we experience it. We believe 2 plus 2 equals 4 because it's fact. Do you believe that as you make your way to work or school, that the drivers around you every day will know how to drive at least to the degree that they won't probably take your life? Those of you who are skateboarding and biking. <laughs> do, you, do you believe that possibly you most likely will get to work or school on the streets of Halifax every day? Probably. As a skateboarder. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a hope, okay? I hope I'll get to work. We do, we do believe, but... This is a little bit different, isn't it? 
Because belief isn't really on experience because you don't know all the drivers that are coming past you. I'm guessing some of them are, are probably texting while they're driving by you on your bicycle or walking while you're walking. You don't know them, so, so it isn't really by experience that you, that you believe this. It isn't a fact, right? It's not a fact that everybody on the road should have a license, probably. That's not a fact. It's, that might be hard to, like, quantify. But you do get up and you go to work or go to school every day. And you probably take the similar route that you go all the time. So you must, on some level, believe in the fact that all of these drivers, bus drivers, truck drivers, car drivers, crazy scooter drivers, crazy old men on those cartwheel things with the, you know, those electric carts, that they are not going to run you over. You, on some level, believe this. So you have faith or belief in something, not so much based on experience or, or fact, maybe based upon the... Um, the system that we have for licensing, but possibly, if you've ever, um, if you've ever driven in a, a, another country, like, like the Middle East country, like Lebanon or Egypt, or uh, in India, possibly, or some people are saying Italy, if you've ever driven in those countries, you're, you may be exercising more faith in the other drivers around you than you are in the system uh, of our licensing and our, our, our laws for driving. But you are exercising faith. You are exercising some belief. So I would say to the question, do you believe, you have to answer yes on many things. That you are a believer. That you actually believe. There is an exercise of faith that has to happen in your everyday life. So yes, I believe in everyday ways, and I would also argue you also have an every way kind of belief, or in every aspect of your life, you function in belief. So it's an every day that you believe, and it's every way that you believe. Every action of your life, you have some function of faith. We cannot function without belief for our every day. You can't function every day without belief. You can't. It's impossible. Uh, you, you believe all sorts of things throughout your day. You, you, you have to. You're exercising some sense of belief every day. And you can't hope for a future that is good or that is better without the exercising of faith without, I'm hoping for a good future. So you can't have hope without belief. So in every way of your life, not just the practical things, but in the greater things, you also exercise faith. And I would say, foundationally, you believe. You have foundations of belief. We all have foundations of belief. And here's where we begin to drill down to the Apostles' Creed. We cannot live a life separated from foundational beliefs. You can't live a life separated from foundation. You all believe something foundationally. It is how God made us, we would say in Christian faith, that foundationally we are made to believe. Can you describe or summarize your foundational beliefs? Because they affect your everyday to day function. And they help you to understand a future that is possibly better or a good future. This is the same case for the church. We have to know foundational beliefs to function every day so that we will know what to expect in the future. It is how we're made. So do you believe? Yes, you believe every day. And yes, you believe in every way. 
Now, what you believe, the basis of your belief, has a real determining factor on your life. So what is the basis of belief? There's this thing called the chain of belief. There's a chain of belief, and I kind of described it as we began. The chain of belief begins with like a foundation as the chain link, and then another link gets locked into it, and then another link gets locked into it. So let me just, uh, for example, use this. What do you believe about raising children? Some of you believe you just shouldn't. Just don't have them. Just don't raise them. Uh, what do you believe? Where, do you, where did you find your foundational belief for raising children? Where do you get that? You tell me. Because you're all cooking in this room, so you tell me. Okay, so from those who have gone before us that we admire. So if we do a reverse uh, chain link, here's you raising your children. Or for those who don't have children, here's you thinking about how you will raise your children and they'll be perfect angels one day until you have a child and then you're like, well, that's out the door. Uh, but, uh, so you have this, this okay, here's how I'm going to raise my children and then the next link is I've learned to raise my children by those who I've admire, admired who uh, maybe have raised their children. I've learned from them. And maybe if you go back another link or maybe this is in the same link, Maybe it goes to like your parents. So I'm assuming most of you have had uh, parental influences to help, help raise you. That you, on some level, are a byproduct of your parents. That may be good, that may be bad. But you've learned some things, maybe do's and don'ts. It's not always do's. Maybe some don'ts as well. You've learned some things from your parents. So how you raise kids, people you admire, your parents. That's the next link. Now, that's getting back farther. But foundationally, why do you want to raise your kids the way you want to raise your kids? There is even foundational beliefs behind. So there is a first link somewhere. So, and you have to reach out and grab that first link somewhere. So maybe that first link is you grabbed it from the ideas of like, here's what child psychology says. Or here's um, you know, what the, the best ways that I can make my, my, uh, my kids successful. This is how I'm going to do this. Here's the foundations of making my kids successful human beings. And so that's your, your basis, your foundation. Everything else you're filtering through that belief. So in the context of Christian faith, for instance, getting to it a little faster, the context of Christian faith, and this matters, is that we believe that God reveals himself to us. That's the foundational first link. You get it? Foundational first link. God reveals himself to us. So, just want to be really clear on something. We didn't make God up. We don't believe we made God up. We don't believe we made God uh, into our image. We don't believe, hey, um, you know what? The God of the Bible is really super messy sometimes. So we've just decided we just want to take the good parts, the things that we like about God. No, we believe if you're a Christian church, you believe that God has revealed himself to us. Even the things that might seem messy to us. This is the first foundational link of belief in Christian faith. And then you lock that into how has God revealed Himself to us? The greatest revelation of God is His Son, Jesus. That's the second foundational link. So the triune God shows Himself to us clearly in Christ. He comes and He dwells among us. Humanity. In particular, he is dwelling among his disciples, his apostles. So there's a third link in what we believe. God the Father, God the Son reveals himself to us 
in particular to the apostles, and the apostles collect or write his word. So that's the third link, or the fourth link. God, the God, triune God, the Son, the apostles, Scripture. And then, as the church begins to grow and mature, to live out what is true, what the truth of Scripture is, they often would write creeds. And so creeds become the narrowed down, the uh, irreducibles of the faith. And so that's another link in how we believe. And then there's the life of the church, which is another link. We have this chain of belief that is foundationally placed in the triune God. And every part of that chain has to go back to that foundation. So when you say, uh, I think the Scripture says this, well, does it go back to the foundations of how God has revealed Himself? Or is it just what you think the Scripture says? The foundationally, it has to go back. So, this is important, and you say, well, Brad, this is just a lot. We haven't even got to the creed yet. We haven't even got to the text yet. Stick with me. This is important. Here's why. Here's one of the reasons why. Foundationally, if I'm listening to the the world now, my foundational belief, and I might be wrong, I'm okay with arguing with it, or talking it out, or having good conversation. You don't want to call it an argument. Foundationally, the world is telling us that we live our own truth. That's our foundation. That's, in the context of the world, we live out our own truths. That's link one. That's what the world would tell us. So you need to rediscover or discover yourself and your truth. That's a foundational one for the world. Here's the problem with this. There's many problems, but here's one of the problems with this. Is it makes you the foundational basis of truth. And you may say, that, well, that's awesome. I get to be whatever I want to be and like to be. That's what's amazing about this. And so it's a, it's a theology of ego. The theology of I. Or the theology of me. Is what it is. Just, just so you know, this is not new. This is, this is really, really old. According to the Bible, Adam and Eve in the garden, Satan comes along and says, if you do this one thing God told you not to do, you will know good and evil. You will be like a God. You know what that means? It means you will get to set your own good and evil. You will be like you're the God of your life. But just so you know, according to Scripture, it's a lie. It's, a, it's, a, it's, not, even a, it's not even a half-truth. It's a lie because God created man and women. So God is, by default, their God. So it's a lie. But this ego self, for instance, it doesn't function well. So if I'm the foundation first link, if I'm the first link of this theology, who I am, my truth, what happens when, you, um, when you're, you're hit by tremendous amount of anxiety and worry and circumstances that you can't control? What happens? Where do you go in those moments In real life moments, so here's what I'm telling you. Some beliefs won't work well in real life moments. This is one of them. Because when you are consumed with anxiety, if you are the interpreter, the foundation of your belief, where do you go? You have to go back to yourself with that anxiety. So you have to to become, for all working purposes, a greater narcissist to deal with your own anxiety. You have no place to go with it. It's a dysfunctional belief. Christian belief, if you're consumed with anxiety, the Bible says, 
If you're anxious, bring your cares to me. Come to me, all you who are heavy hearted, uh, all you who are burdened, all you who are anxious, bring your cares to me. He's, he's the foundational link, the triune God is the foundational link for your beliefs. You have someplace to go that's outside yourself. And you can say, This is help. Help God. I need you, God. I don't know what I'm going to do now, God. Be close to me, God. Know me, God. See me, God. You have a place to go. Another way that um, your own truth doesn't function well, and we see this often, is uh, as, the, as the base link of your belief, is what happens when someone challenges your interpretation of your great truth? What happens if they say, ah, it's wrong, or it's not right, or it's, it's not true, or, or that's not going to help you, that's going to destroy you. Or that's not as it should be. What happens when someone confronts you? Well, culturally, we find ways to cancel them. Or we find ways to defame them. Or we find ways to lock them out of our life. What would a Scripture say? What does Scripture say when, when uh, Christians come up against those who would, who would be their enemies? What does the Bible say for Christians when it, when it talks about their enemies? You tell me. Love your enemies. Pray for those who would do wrong to you. You know what Scripture is saying? Do all you can to befriend your enemy because you might win them to the hope that is the foundational truth of God. Demonstrate the kindness of God to your enemies. Because it's a foundational truth outside yourself. This is why this is important. It functions in your life. There's a function to it. This is the basic chain of belief. It has teeth, this chain of belief. It will show itself to be right or to be empty, depending on your foundational place of belief. Let's look at this creed of belief because this tries to summarize the... uh, the very foundational bases, the very first chain links of what a Christian believes. So let's see it. Do do we have it on screen, guys? Awesome. All right. Let's stand up because it's really hot and you're all sleeping. It's always, in case you didn't know, as a pastor, it's always fun to watch the congregation. Um, It's one of the privileges that I have every Sunday to watch the congregation. I won't judge. Sometimes I fall asleep in my own sermons too. Uh, Apostles' Creed. All right, let's read this together, okay? Think about this. Now that we've said all that I've said, this is foundation one. This is the link. The pro- I'm trying to summarize this primary link. Out of this primary link comes the Christian faith. All right, let's see it. Let's read it together. Ready? I believe in God the Father Almighty. Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Here's a few summary thoughts about this first link. It's called the Apostles' Creed but the apostles didn't write it. All right? It wasn't the apostles didn't get together and say, hey, let's write a creed. It was later on, it was in the first uh, 
early centuries of the church that the church began to say, let's get uh, the gist, the heart, the irreducibles of what the apostles taught and let's summarize them so they're clear and concise. What does that do? What does that do for the church? When they gather the teachings of the apostles and make them clear and concise, it does all kinds of things, doesn't it? Uh, it is pretty typical in the first centuries of the church that they had two things. They had these um, statements of conduct, uh, statements of uh, rules of faith, they called them, uh, and they gave direction for the church's beliefs and, and talked about moral character. Or they had creeds, which were like succinct doctrinal statements. You think about it. First century, second century, there was only a handful of people, relatively, uh, in regards to the large population, a small percentage that could actually read. So if you take the beliefs of the church and then make it small enough and clear enough so that it can be memorized, even by children, what a what a strengthening effect that has on the young church. And so that's one of the reasons why they did this. Also, they did this because um, their false teachers crept in. And there began to be things that were, uh, that were taught that sounded like the Bible or sounded like uh, theology from the apostles, but they weren't quite. They were a little bit off. In fact, one of the doctrines that was going around was that um, God of the Old Testament was an angry God. And he shows up in Jesus, and he's much more pleasant. He's so much happier. He kind of grew up a little bit. That was actually floating around early church. Uh, some of the church fathers, like Tertullian, was one of the persons who, who writes a lot uh, regarding, like, like against like, false doctrine. And Tertullian was one of the ones who first began to use what was called the Roman symbol, which was the creed of the Roman church. And it was about 50 or 60 years after, after Christ went back to heaven. Well, 50 or 60 years after that, Tertullian is using this, this uh, rehearsing, this uh, Roman symbol or Roman creed. And it's almost exactly like the Apostles' Creed. They oftentimes would use it for baptism. So if you were in the baptismal, they would say, declare what you believe. And you would say something like, I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. And so they had this, this uh, creed that you would memorize and it would be a basis, foundational basis of your baptism. So it's an important part of helping us see this, this first link in where we believe and why. Throughout church history, the church commentators, as they began to teach about the creed, they often would do what I have just de- done. They often, as you read, uh, and I've read several documents about the, about the uh, Apostles' Creed, they often would spend time on, I believe. Because they want you to know You function in faith, in belief, every day, all the time. But is the foundation of your function of faith, is it tied to, is it in God? The triune God who is at work in your life. Or is it attached to an ever-shifting world? The creed isn't simply a set of propositions for us to say amen to but it is the faith once for all delivered to the saints through which we experience communion with God and one with one another. Faith is to acknowledge and rest in the unchangeable will of God, namely, that He will graciously give us the salvation promised through the prophets and present present it in reality through Christ as the articles of faith do testify. Biblical faith lays hold of faith's content and makes it one's own. This is for you in particular. 
you who may be seeking to know God, this is for you to connect belief to him. But you know what else it's for? It's for us. It attaches our church to the Orthodox church since the beginning of the church. We are in a line of faith. Pax, we are in a line of faith. At the end of our statement of faith, it says this statement of faith is in keeping with the Apostles' Creed. We are a part of the redemptive work that God is doing in the church. Does what you believe matter? Yes, it does. It matters in the everyday. That's what we've said. It matters as your foundation. We've talked about that. But getting back to the text in Acts 8, look at Acts 8 for a minute. I'm going to summarize a couple things for you. This is the last thing. This parable is about belief. It's about belief. I long for my life to bring a hopeful future or a hopeful fruit. This parable ends with the promise of a hopeful fruit. You see that? See that there at the end of the parable? It says, As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. I long for my life to bring good, hopeful fruit. It is a pretty well-known statement. What you reap is what you sow. Have you heard that before, right? It's not the first time you've heard that. What you reap is what you sow. So it is impossible. Get this. It is impossible to plant a seed that is poisonous from the beginning and expect it will bring, bring, bring good fruit in the end. You know that? Impossible. The good fruit he's talking about here has the seed of the Word of God. The foundational seed is the revealing of who God is in Christ given to the apostles in Scripture, that's what we are planted in, or that's what is planted in us. And as that is planted in us, and our lives center on that belief, the truth is, or the result is, it is impossible to bring poison fruit when there is a seed that is good seed to bring good fruit. It's impossible to bring poison fruit when your life is being planted with good fruit. What you reap is what you sow. Now, it may take some time. You may need to be patient. You may need to continue to do the work of a farmer as you're patient with that. But that's this parable. This parable says... As the seed is sown, the heart that doesn't receive it, the, the hard heart, the heart that says no, that is not foundationally what I want to believe. I don't want to believe that. I will not believe that. The picture is Satan himself comes and steals the fruit away, or steals the seed away. So there's no fruit in the end. There doesn't seem to be any good fruit. He doesn't tell us there's good fruit. Or there's a seed that is, gets planted in some kind of a soft soil. It falls in there and it grows up really quickly. But the heart is, is a rocky heart. It's, it's got a lot of other things in it. There's all kinds of distractions in there. There's not a, 
there's not a work being done to, to remove the other things. And so the seed doesn't, it doesn't have the, 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 the root or the soil, the nutrients it needs. It's rocky. And so it springs up and then it dies off. Because, here's the thing about the Word of God and the foundations of who God is. God does not share His glory. He is God. He's not going to be one of many things in your life. He is God. He has created you and made you. Therefore, He must be all. He must be the center. He must be the foundation. You just can't be added to your already pretty good life. You might spring up, but you'll never grow mature into fruit. And then there's a soil that, that uh, it starts, it springs up, it starts to grow, but it's also growing along with all these thorns and thistles and, and weeds, and the heat of the day starts to come down. And the pressure of life starts to come down. And so there's no, there's no weeding and there's no patience in the... It's a, this is too hard. And let me just tell you this. Walking as a Christian in this world with the triune God as the foundation of who you are, in this context, it's going to be hard. And if I'm, I'm not a prophet, but if I was to make a prophecy, I would tell you I believe it's going to get harder. You need to know that God is who He says He is. That, that's so important in your faith. That God is who He says He is. And you need to grab hold of that, sink down into that, so that the weeds can be pulled out. And so that when it gets hot and hard in your life, that you're able to say, no, even though this is difficult, and there's pain, and there's suffering, I will rejoice in the suffering. Because my roots are going deeper in Christ. This is the picture of believing. The question at the end of the day is not do you believe, because you do believe. You all function in belief. We all do. Not, um, am I just going to grab hold of this Christian thing because it seems like just one of those things that my friends are doing or, or uh, it seems kind of logical or... or um, there's a promise that God will somehow bless me if I do all the right things. The question that you need to ask is, is God foundationally the heart, the place, the root of all belief? Does He make sense of this world? And then as you place faith in Him because of Christ, you begin to let the other things be rooted out in your life or sorted out in your life. That's the question at the end of the day. That's why the Apostle Creed is important. That's what we'll see over the next several weeks. Let me pray. So God, we give you thanks and praise for your kindness and grace. We thank you, dear God, that we can come to you, to your word. We can see pictures of who you are, illustrations, parables, examples. You do not leave us with some um, stoic, staunchy, uh, religious theology. You, you, uh, you speak to our hearts. You meet us where our deepest needs are. You call out uh, those things we don't even want you to know, yet you know them. Dear God, you are close to us. When we read your word, when we pray to you, when we sing worship songs to you, when we think on you, when we take the things of this world and we, we uh, overlap them with who you are, God, you draw close to us. Your spirit speaks through your word and through your people. And so even now, God, as we turn to You, as we think on You, as we think about what You've taught us today, we ask that You would penetrate those places in our lives where we're holding out, where we're hardening our hearts, when we're just living in unbelief. Help us to know that You are a good God who loves us deeply and would draw us 
to your goodness that our lives would bring meaningful fruit. Enable our confessions even today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.